So thanks everyone who's able to make it tonight uh, to this event. Um, we are going to introduce uh, Dr. Sally Kraft, uh, who is the VP of Population Health at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, this was an event sponsored by Black Lives Matter Windsor and the Windsor Public Library, and it's part of the Windsor Pride Week 2021 schedule of events. Um, Sally is going to give us a presentation on um, health, healthcare, and uh, disparities in the Upper Valley and beyond tonight. And uh, without any more from me, I will turn it over to Sally. Great. Oh, and if you have, sorry, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat field. Um, but this is going to be a discussion, so feel free to chime in too when there's breaks in the uh, in the presentation. Great, thank you, Davis. And um, what's really nice about a small group is people can just take themselves right off of mute and uh, say, "I don't get it," or uh, "I want you to explain that a little bit more." Um, and it also is a great opportunity for me to ask questions. Um, before I even bring up the slides, I have to confess that I'm um, uh, truly still learning in this area of uh, what makes health. I know that might sound sort of crazy that a doctor is still learning about health, but we'll talk about um, health and healthcare and how the two are different. And um, with all sincerity, um, this is a journey of learning, I think, for all of us, and, um, and I include myself uh, maybe at the top of the line. I'm really eager to learn. I'm eager to hear your ideas, um, and so please, um, as much interaction as we have I, have, I do have a few slides. I'll go through those, um, but take yourself off mute with a small group like this. We can just have a discussion. Or if you're more comfortable um, putting your comments in chat, um, Davis promised me that he would um, he would uh, take a look at those. So let me pull up um, some slides, and we'll use the slides to kind of guide our conversation. And um, hopefully, I can share some information that might be um, a little bit um, new or a different way of looking at things for you. So today, um, what I'd like to cover is I'd like us to talk about what impacts our health and then to talk about how health might vary based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And then what has COVID-19 taught us about health disparities? And um, of all the pain that COVID-19 has introduced into all of our lives, um, I really hope that we're all taking a chance to reflect and to learn from this painful episode of our histories and together to forge a new normal, not to go back to the way things used to be, but to really define a new normal. So I wanna introduce you to a friend of mine. It's not a real friend, it's, that was just a pretend. Um, Mrs. Buckley. Mrs. Buckley is 76 years old and she lives alone. Her son lives in California and she's insured by Medicare. She has emphysema, which is also called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, congestive heart failure, and some early signs of dementia. And there's quite a bit of COVID-19 in her community still at this point in time. She never finished high school she worked for many years as a self-employed seamstress. And at the time that she quit, she had minimal savings. So she really watches her pennies. She used to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, but she quit 20 years ago. She doesn't have a car. And when she does get a ride to the grocery store, she'll stock up on a lot of canned goods um, um, so that she, um, you know, to avoid uh, um, perishable goods. And two days ago, her water pill or her diuretic ran out. And because she had concerns about COVID, uh, she didn't go in to fill her prescription. So she called her primary care doctor, but unfortunately her internist office was closed for in-person visits due to COVID-19. And they were starting, they were offering telehealth um, uh, appointments but um, honestly, Mrs. Buckley was like, she was completely overwhelmed with trying to set up that computer and sign on and get the video going. And she just, uh, it was too overwhelming. So she spoke to the recept receptionist on the phone and the receptionist said, um, if you're short of breath, you should go to the hospital. Um, 
So Mrs. Buckley said, I don't really want to go, but I'll go. And um, she don't have a car. So she had to call 911 to get the ambulance to come and pick her up. When she got to the hospital, the doctor noticed that she had an abnormal heart tracing. This abnormality was actually an old finding. And um, if he had had access, the physician in the ED had had access to her tracing, which was at another hospital, he would have known that it was an old finding, but an elderly woman, short of breath, history of congestive heart failure and other medical problems and an abnormal heart tracing, the decision was made to admit her to the hospital. So in the hospital, she meets yet another physician. Uh, this physician is called a hospitalist. These are people who, docs who, um, or providers who uh, work solely in the hospital and they take care of the patients who are in the hospital. Um, they don't see patients uh, in, the, in the office. And the hospitalist assumed care for Mrs. Buckley. Um, she gave her some um, uh, uh, diuretic in her in the vein in the in the IV so that she could get rid of that extra fluid that was causing her to be short of breath. And because Mrs. Buckley was a little confused and a little unstable on her feet, um, the hospitalist decided to put a catheter into her bladder so she didn't have to get up and down um, all night long. Unfortunately, Mrs. Buckley got an infection from that catheter and the hospitalist had to prescribe an antibiotic. Now this is an antibiotic that Mrs. Buckley had taken in the past um, and she's not allergic to her to the antibiotic, but it just makes her really, really nauseated. And so um, she stopped eating and she just um, started to peter out and got weaker and weaker. And, um, you know, who's ever been able to sleep in a hospital? Her sleep was definitely uh, disrupted. So she's sleep deprived and getting weaker and got more and more confused. And after a whole week in the hospital, Mrs. Buckley was too weak to go home. And her son who lives all the way in California had to fly out to help select a nursing home uh, for his mom. This is not that uncommon a story for the hospital. So as we think about that story, there are two questions that I wanna focus on. One is, did she get good health care? And then the other is what factors and what factors impacted her health? So as we think about health care, the office visit, telehealth or attempted telehealth, hospital care, the medicine she was on, what do people think? And and one, you can just take yourself off mute. What do you think? Did she get good health care? I see some shaking heads no. Why or why not? Very poor communication. Poor communication, yeah. And that poor communication ended up with probably leading to maybe even a hospital stay that she didn't need to have, right? And then every decision, not every decision, but many of the decisions seem to be impaired by not having knowledge of what had happened in the past. So communication. Are people surprised by that lack of communication, especially in the era of electronic health records? I mean, a lot of times folks go, oh, we have an electronic health record. I mean, communication should be perfect. Unfortunately, what many um, of us uh, have to deal with is the fact that most of these electronic health records don't talk to each other well if they talk to each other at all. And often you'll get, um, uh, 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 if you do get information coming from another electronic health record, it's in such a, uh, 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 a package that it's really hard to go through, especially in a short period of time to get the information that you're looking for, especially when you're in an emergency room. Other ideas about what, how our healthcare was good or, or not good? It was just a mess. They were not meeting her where she was. She's somebody who can't use the telemedicine, couldn't 
the doctor talk to her on the phone? She can use the phone. Just. Yep. So, um, so phone visits, um, which during COVID-19 have been paid for, um, I can tell you there's great gnashing of teeth amongst the health insurance companies about whether or not they should continue to pay for phone visits with the great concern being that we will abuse those phone visits and that this will be a way for the health systems and physicians to um, just kind of, oh, we'll make some phone calls, make some phone calls and provide care and get reimbursed for it. So um, there's a lot of uncertainty as we're moving into the future about what's gonna continue to be reimbursed. I'll say um, as a, if I was the doc on the other end of that phone, uh, I would probably, I may very well have told um, Mrs. Buckley to go ahead and go to the emergency room. I'd be really concerned if she was short of breath and um, alone in her home and didn't have the support that she needed. Kind of interesting that we can't, we don't, our systems aren't set up to send care out to the home, are they? Remember the old days of Marcus Welby and I'll date myself where uh, uh, house calls were a usual part of healthcare. And we have visiting nurses um, in our system and we have ho some home support, but it's often very, very hard to, um, to uh, get hold of someone who can come to the house and do an assessment and take care of you. And um, physicians and um, uh, advanced practice nurses are generally working in clinics. And in general, you have to see a lot of patients to generate enough revenue to keep the clinic open. So it's pretty cost inefficient to be doing home care and, and house visits. Not impossible, but pretty cost, it's pretty costly. And then when you think about visiting nurses, you have to qualify for visiting nurse services. And that qualification includes being homebound. And Mrs. Buckley wasn't really homebound. So we have all these system issues that related to the way our healthcare system, our healthcare delivery system is organized in the United States that doesn't do a very good job taking care of Mrs. Buckley. And then when you think about other things that impacted her health in general, what are some of your thoughts as you think back about the story about how she lived and, and where she came from and what some of her health behaviors were in the past? Well, th this whole thing is like a, a pebble rolling down a, yeah. a snowy hill collecting because it, it basically starts because she runs out of a medication. So, there, there's like a systemic failure right at the start of that. You know, the, for some reason, it's impossible for her to get a prescription refill. Yeah. Then this whole thing just snowballs into this disaster. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's no proactive part of the system, is there, that kind of knew she was getting to the end of her prescription and could help her. And she lived alone, so she didn't really, she did not have very many people who were looking in on her. And her son, I'm not blaming her son. Actually, my kids, two of my kids live in California. You know, right. he had to go to where the jobs were. So he wasn't able to find work in our rural region that was um, uh, the kind of work that he had trained for. Again, living in a rural region introduces a whole host of um, uh concerns and, and issues. And some of those things that we were talking about in terms of um, maybe a proactive system of someone coming in and checking on her, an aid or something like that, frequently our rural, our rural environments can't afford that kind of, um, of resource. Mm. So let's talk about what actually determines health. 
And you'll notice that I've been using, I've been sort of emphasizing the health. And I want to make a differentiation between health and health care. And I think that this is um, uh, something that I feel that COVID-19 has really taught all of us is that healthcare is definitely part of the equation. If we think about health outcomes as how long do you live and how well do you live? Morbidity, mortality. All of us wanna live the richest, fullest life for as long as we can. And what are all the factors that go into how long we live and how well we live? Well, if you look at this graph, you can see that clinical care is only 20% of the whole equation. This is the 80-20 rule that you know we all talk about. Clinical care probably is maybe 10, 10 to 20% of the equation. It's an expensive part of the equation, but it's not the whole enchilada here. 80% of your health is determined by non-clinical factors. And those factors include your health behaviors. Did you smoke? Remember Mrs. Buckley smoked? Mm -hmm. What's your diet like? Remember when she goes to the grocery store, she has to stock up on canned food. We all know that canned food is not as good for you as fresh produce. Lots of salt in that, which contributed to her congestive heart failure alcohol use, unsafe sex, these behaviors that have a direct impact on your health. Socio and economic factors have about a 40% impact on your health. Education, employment, where you live, how safe is your community? Who watches over you? What are your uh, family and social supports? And your physical environment and that's particularly uh, uh, pertinent to us in our rural environment here, uh, plays about a 10% role. So these are not fixed in stone um, uh, percentages, but I think the take home here, and what I, if you remember anything from the talk today is 80-20, 80% of your health is determined by non-clinical services not by health care, but by all those other things that influence our health. What is not on here is uh, genetics, and that does clearly have uh, an impact, but there's, uh, we're not at a point in our sophistication in healthcare where we can easily modify genes. There's some genetic modification we can do, but not, not a lot. So these are really the modifiable um, factors that impact health. And all of us, as we've been reading and learning about COVID-19, have now become familiar with this term, the social determinants of health. When you hear that term, think about 80-20, 80-20. These are the circumstances in which we are born, grow up, live, work, and age, as well as the systems put in place to deal with illness. And these circumstances are shaped by a wide set of forces, economic, social policies, and politics. It's exactly what this graph is showing you, programs and policies, and then health factors, health behaviors, socioeconomic factors, and physical environment. Everyone now is reading about the social determinants of health because COVID-19 has really driven this home. So, I just highlighted some of these social determinants of health. Mrs. Buckley's isolated. Do you know that your morbidity and mortality goes up about 30% for isolated people? They die earlier and suffer more diseases when you're isolated. She never finished high school. She had minimal savings. She smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. She didn't have a car. Transportation is a huge barrier here in the, um, in the upper valley. She stocks up on canned goods and she couldn't use a computer. And if anything that has come forward through COVID-19 is that computer literacy and health literacy and access to the internet is gonna be critically important now. And it's gonna be even more so I predict in the future. So this concept is sort of wrapped up in this one comment. When it comes to your health, your zip code matters more than your genetic code. 
So take a look at this. This is right now. I'm sorry, I'm, a, I'm working a little bit. Um, well, we've got Windsor, Vermont in here, but I'm looking at a 35 mile radius from Norwich to Newport. And look at the life expectancy. Life expectancy is calculated through a series of um, uh, uh, using different data, but it's basically saying, if you were born today, how long can you expect to live? If you were born in Norwich, you can expect to live 86 years. If you're born in Windsor, only 77. And if you're born in Newport, only 75. There's a, a difference of 10 years of life expectancy just in 35 miles. And a lot of it, not all of it, but remember I said 40% were the socioeconomic factors. A lot of it is driven by wealth and income. Look at the median household income in Norwich is twice that of Newport. And then what if Mrs. Buckley was black? Wonder if we to I told this whole story, but Mrs. Buckley was black. Does that change the story that I just told you? You bet it does. This is the uh, one of the most embarrassing and painful graphs that I tell, I show um, and have been showing for years. The mortality, and again, this is um, uh, life expectancy, that same, that same concept of if you're born today white and if you're born today black, what's the gap? And that gap has um, been wide for years and it continues to be wide. Um, five, eight, 10 years, depending on, uh, on, on the sex. But we see this persistent gap in between um, uh, blacks and whites in the United States of America. And it has persisted for decades and generations. And it persists even if you, if, even if we account for education and income, this is actually looking at infant mortality rates. And we're looking at um, those who have less than high school, high school or college. So we're correcting for education. But when you look at the African-American non-Hispanic infant mortality rates, so these are the number of babies that die per 1,000 um, live births, it is always higher regardless of education level. And the same thing is true regardless of income level. There are enormous disparities in the health of our um, uh, BIPOC uh, um, uh, communities. This is a um, uh, uh, just a graph showing diabetes again, over and over again, we're going to see that uh, uh, the BIPOC community suffers from higher rates of chronic diseases compared to whites in the, in the United States. I could put up hypertension, diabetes, um, uh, pulmonary disease, almost any one of these diseases. We, we always see this persistent increase in um, the disease prevalence when we look at BIPOC communities compared to the white communities. And again, a lot of that being driven by socioeconomic factors and all of those other non-clinical factors. Although I will say the clinical factors make a difference. There is a difference in health and how um, uh, 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 different populations are treated in hospitals and healthcare settings. But most of this difference is probably driven by these um, non-clinical factors. And this is just showing this persistent uh, income disparity by race um, over the years that has just continued and continued through the years and has actually even increased in greater disparity um, over the last uh, decades. And then what about if Mrs. Buckley was lesbian? Would that make a difference in her health outcomes and what we would expect? We know that the LGBTQ population suffers greatly in terms of um, uh, their experience in the healthcare systems and in their health outcomes. Again, many of those reasons have to do with the non-clinical care, but the, this, um, uh, these, this data here before you is really, I thought, um, really sobering and, and very upsetting that 16% of the LGBTQ um, population reported being personally 
discriminated against um, when they went to a doctor or a health clinic. That's not, I'm, this is not local information, this is uh, national information. That 22% of transgender individuals avoided doctors or healthcare out of concern they would be discriminated against. And 31% say they have no regular doctor or form of health care. We've, um, Dr. Um, uh, Domian at um, Dartmouth did a, a paper looking at routine gynecologic care in our LGBTQ community and found that um, patients who were coming to Dartmouth, this is a published paper um, in the LGBTQ population, ten, had less preventative gynecologic care compared to um, uh, 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 the general population. So even in our local areas, we know that this is happening. We know that the LGBT population as a whole is at an increased risk of, dep of depression and suffers from higher rates of suicide. And that this is, this is data from Massachusetts from uh, 2011 to 16, but you can see in the uh, graph on the left, 20% of the LGBT population suffered from 15 days of poor mental health in the last month compared to 10%. And 40% had been diagnosed with um, depression compared to 20%, 19%. So mental health is an enormous risk in um, the LGBTQ uh, population. And there are many, many, many reasons for that. Um, but um, uh, the uh, consequences being we have a, a population with high mental health rates of disease, high suicide risk, and they're scared to go to the doctor and to the clinic. And then this is just a snapshot of um, looking at those non-clinical impact factors that impact your health. The social drivers are determinants of health. And um, the uh, dark blue is the LGBT population compared to the non-LGBT population, which is in the lighter blue gray. And you can see all along the way, unemployment, higher LGBT, uninsured, higher LGBT, food insecure, higher LGBT. Those who are living in poverty have an income less than $24,000 um, a year, higher. This is a group of people who are at risk for having poor health and poor health care and um, are a, a rising concern for all of us in the healthcare delivery system. So let's just spend a couple minutes talking about COVID and what we've learned from COVID. And then we'll um, open to a larger conversation. And um, what I'd really love to do is hear your thoughts and your observations about where we have opportunities to improve. So this is our familiar COVID virus. Um, we've all grown very familiar with this picture, I'm afraid. Um, those little, uh, just as an aside, those little uh, pink spiky things are the spike protein that everyone that you've heard uh, talked about a lot. That's what the, um, the vaccine is working on. It's teaching your body to make antibodies to those um, little pink proteins. And what have we learned from COVID um, over the last year? So let's go back. This is an, an infectious disease. And as an infectious disease, you would think, hey, everyone's at equal risk for getting COVID-19. Come on, it's a virus. A virus doesn't search out and go, oh, you are a black person or you are a, um, a lesbian or you are transgender. It, the virus is, you know, it's sort of an equal infector. But that's not what the data has showed us. The data has showed us that it's unequal in the impact. It's unequal in the impact clinically, and it's unequal in the impact in terms of disruption to jobs, to families, to uh, uh, well-being. And why would that be? How could a virus, how would a virus cause more disease amongst the African-American community or 
more disease amongst the Latino community. It all goes back to that 80-20 rule. If 80% of your health is determined by, by uh, factors that really aren't related to health care, then we can expect a virus to seek out those most vulnerable and to uh, have greater impact there. So what does our data show us? Well, we have to move the slides. This is from earlier um, in the pandemic, but I think um, it's uh, March uh, 3rd, 2021, but it still holds. Nationwide, Black people have died at 1.4 times the rate of white people. And then we can see all along here that we uh, both the Hispanic and Latino um, ethnic group, um, uh, uh, Native Hawaiians, American Indians, and Alaska Natives all have a greater mortality rate when they get sick from COVID-19 compared to white people. And that is held true even in New Hampshire and Vermont. This is a little bit older data, um, but I really like the graphs and the, and the more recent data, um, uh, it was harder to, to get a good graph. So let's go all the way back to March 7th, which were dark, dark days indeed, weren't they? You can see here that um, in terms of the cases per 100,000 people, that in the state of New Hampshire, our Hispanic and Latino um, populations were more likely to have contracted COVID-19, that's the cases per 100,000, compared to the white population. Even though the white population is much bigger in New Hampshire, the case rate, the number of cases per um, 100,000 was higher in Hispanics and our um, uh, Black African American populations. That was our Black African American populations were more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19. But actually, truthfully, in, in New Hampshire, our white um, populations were most likely to have died. And that probably is a, a result of how much bigger uh, the white population is in um, New Hampshire compared to the other groups. But remember that these are these rates are showing us that even though we have a relatively small percentage of our population that's Hispanic, Latino, or Black African American, they had high rates of infection and high rates of hospitalization. Again, looking at Vermont, we also see that this data held up in the same way. Again, again I'm going to use data from back in March on March uh, 7th, mostly just because the graphs are, um, are easier to see. But you can see that the Black and African American population in Vermont had, what, had higher rates of infection than did the uh, white population. And again, once we start getting into small numbers, and thank God the number of deaths in uh, Vermont have been relatively small, um, it's, hard, it's hard to make any statistical decisions about um, what this represents. And then when we start to think about vaccination rates and how do we protect the population from um, COVID-19, and kudos to Vermont, uh, which leads the country in terms of um, uh, eligible population receiving uh, at least one, one dose of the vaccine. But this is what scares me is when we go back to March uh, 15th and we look um, Asian, white, Hispanic, and black. Black is the lower number than Hispanic, white, Asian. Asian um, uh, population has uh, um, reached that 70% mark. Uh, let's see if I can get rid of that. Reached 70% um, having um, at least one uh, dose of the vaccine. And they reached that, um, this is uh, nationally, they reached that um, sooner before uh, the other um, ethnic groups or race groups. But you can see that there's this persistent disparity between the black and the white population in terms of vaccination rates. Again, many reasons for that, but this makes me 
concern because we've already talked about the higher rates of disease and higher rates of hospitalization in the black population and Hispanic population, even here in Vermont and New Hampshire. And now we're seeing lower vaccination rates in those populations. And I fear that that means that we're gonna to continue to see a widening and widening disparity of disease prevalence and impact in the um, non-white population. And in Vermont, this is uh, information just from a, a couple of days ago. We again see that disparity in vaccination rates that is held up nationally. And we also see this uh, in Vermont. And um, again, this is a, a couple of days ago, but we can see that the black population in Vermont has received um, a vaccination rate of 60% compared to the white population of 74%. So again, this persistent disparity in, vaccina in vaccination rates, a persistent disparity in disease rates. Some of this has to do with culture, with stigma, with distrust of the health system. But those disease rates have a lot to do with those socioeconomic um, uh, 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 factors that impact our health. We know that the black population nationally tends to have lower income. They work in essential jobs where they can't, they don't have the privilege of staying home and telecommuting. That the BIPOC population um, particularly um, uh, is uh, uh, often uh, those, uh, that group, the higher percentage that lives in poverty is living in intergenerational homes where there's greater risk of um, infection where transportation, they are maybe have to use public transportation and be at um, increased risk of exposure to uh, COVID-19. So once again, those social socioeconomic um, factors have had a huge impact. And what about the LGBTQ population? I I don't have very much to say because we don't even have very much data about this population. This terrifies me. This is a population that just a couple minutes ago I was highlighting to you have worse health outcomes. They, are, they suffer from higher rates of chronic disease. They suffer from uh, higher rates of poverty, higher rates of food insecurity, higher rates of distress. And we don't even know what their vaccination rates are because very, very few states are collecting this information. We know that this population, for all the reasons that we've talked about, is at higher risk for co uh, severe COVID-19 disease, higher risk of chronic disease, higher risk of uh, those socioeconomic factors um, uh, and stresses that impact health. And yet we don't know, we don't know what vaccination rates um, are like in the LGBTQ population. And I'm worried because this is a population that has a lot of distrust for the healthcare system and is, is concerned about um, going forward to healthcare providers. So I'm gonna end with just saying um, that I think we are at a turning point in our communities. And I, I love this title, The Fierce Urgency of Now. I think that we are, we have the opportunity to define a new normal, that we have the opportunity to say, we're, we're coming through, we're not done with the pandemic, there's still COVID-19 out there, we have to increase vaccination rates, we have to be smart about when we are using masking and when we are using physical distance um, um, uh, um, interventions. But we have to say to ourselves, is this an opportunity for us to change? Is this an opportunity for us to address the rates of poverty, the disparities that we see in education, in income, in employment, in opportunity? housing insecurity, food insecurity. 
I think it's a time for all of us to demand from our healthcare providers like Sally, are you looking at the data? Are you certain that when a patient who identifies as transgender and, and um, comes to you that you, you are treating, your entire health system is treating that transgender individual with respect, that you know whether or not they're transgender, that you are making sure that they receive the appropriate care in a non-judgmental, respectful way. Are you making sure, Sally, that you're looking at the black individual in front of you and treating them exactly as you would the white individual and providing that same level of healthcare services? And Sally, are you in your healthcare system asking, are you hungry? Do you have a way to get to your next appointment? Are you employed? Can I help you with, tr with transportation? Are you safe at home? I fully admit that the healthcare system, we have a lot of room to improve, but I can also tell you that the healthcare system cannot do this by ourselves. First of all, we know from today's uh, discussion that 80% of health, of health is due to those non-clinical factors. So even if Sally and Dartmouth Hitchcock and Alice Peck Day and Mount Scutney do it perfectly well, we still have a lot of those factors that are impacting health. And that's why I believe that the new normal that I'm hoping to establish with all of you will be one of a partnership that we will work together with community organizations, with community leaders to understand how to address these non-clinical health drivers, jobs and education and opportunities for um, good public transportation and, and safety and policies that make it so that if you're sick at work, you don't have to go to work. That all of these things are are opportunities for us to work together, health system and community partnership, community organizations and government together. Because I think if we don't address both the 80 and the 20, in 10 years, I'll be given the same talk with those same disparities. And I don't wanna do it. I wanna give a talk that shows that life expectancy for a black man born in 2020 man, it's exactly the same as a white man. And that a transgender individual coming to our health system feels respected and trusted and gets the same healthcare services that anyone else would get. So I will end uh, the slides and look forward to hearing from you about how you think, um, how you think these partnerships and opportunities, how can we take advantage of dealing, of working together to deal with these, all of these factors that influence our health. So maybe uh, to start things off, if someone would be um, uh, willing to share what kind of uh, work they do or what kind of community-based organization they volunteer at and, and what are their observations about how their em their employer or their community or where they volunteer can be active in solving these health problems? Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca Roisman and I live in Windsor. Um, I know some of you that are online. Um, one of the things I um, that stood out in my mind when we were talking about um, the patient earlier was um, her inability um, to uh, have a person visit um, with her and, and, and assess what's going on with her. Now, in the last, I think, two, three years, maybe longer than that, uh, Windsor has a program which is called SASH. Um, yeah. And um, SASH focuses on retirement individuals that are 65 and older 
um, to assist them to remain um, in their homes independently. Um, as we know, there are not sufficient facilities to address the issues of the elderly. Um, what I was thinking was um, one of the things that can happen with, and I and I've uh, taken advantage of the program, and I and I I think um, very positive of it. But um, why can't a program like that be extended not only to individuals 65 and older, but why can't it be uh, available to individuals in the community that are willing to um, um, participate? Um, uh, I, I don't know what that would look like. I know that there's a cost to a program like this, but it really does allow for um, a sort of a relationship to be built with an individual in the community um, and the um, health care system, but not necessarily it being the hospital or the clinic. That That's, I, I, as you were sharing this and saying, how do we, how do we bridge what we have or how do we use what we have um, um, moving forward? Maybe we need to think about what we have and um, how can we tweak that to make it available to others that are probably, as you say, either afraid to um, access uh, medical services because of the distrust um, of how they be treated. but. Um, those are my thoughts. I, I, um, I am so impressed with the SASH program. I, you know, the state of Vermont has done some really innovative um, healthcare program programming. And um, I think you hit the nail right on the head. It costs money. Um, so it's always a balance, right? With um, how much money does it cost? And then, so sorry for, I sound crude when I say that, but how much benefit is there? And um, the state of Vermont is very progressive. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, the investments that the state will make in order to keep people healthy and in their home. So I, I agree, I'd love to see SASH expand. I'd like, will you throw, lob it over the river too so that we can have it in New Hampshire? Um, the, the issue is always cost. But Rebecca, I, I, you know, I was thinking as I was listening to you and, and you, you, you talked about the power of a relationship, I think about social isolation. I was stunned when I learned that there's a 30% increase in sickness and even early death with, when people are socially isolated. And I thought, you know, we live in small communities in, in rural uh, Northern New England. I, it wouldn't cost that much to set up phone trees or uh, a buddy system or, you know, um, I don't know, people don't go to church as much anymore, but, you know, high school kids just making a, hey, let me stop by twice a week. How about the mailman? I noticed that when I opened up your, if, if you have a mailbox, I opened up your mailbox and no one had picked up the mail. Recently. I mean, you know, you could think about how to build in those, um, those bonds and those relationships. And, um, and I don't think it would cost very much. It wouldn't be healthcare, but it could address social isolation. So it's that kind of thinking that makes me go, I think we could figure stuff out. I really do. But I, I, I agree with you. I think the SASH program is very impressive. And it, the question is, how do you fund programs like that? So we have to think, how do we create the benefits of a program like that without having to spend a lot of money? And I think Northern New England folk are pretty, pretty innovative. So Other Sally, thoughts? yeah, Davis. So hearing you talk about these, uh, you know, these opportunities possibly for you know the mailman or, or local kids or neighbors to to take take care of each other and be aware, I, the connection that forms in my mind is between is really just like teaching teaching community and teaching empathy and, and facilitating those things. Um, you know, I think I think your example too of you know we not not as many folks go to church now, and I think. I think that speaks to like we're we're in sort of a cultural moment where people are finding new 
new communities within their communities and, and yeah. figuring out ways to be connected and figuring out how to, uh, how to, how to care for each other. Um, and I think that when we look at those social determinants of health, right, that's, you know, just encouraging and teaching empathy is a huge part of that. Um, cause I think it's, it's pretty easy, even, even through COVID to get really wrapped up in our own routine and not really have that moment of, of care for the folks around us. Like, you know, just being aware of like, you know, how our neighbors are doing, yeah. you know, if, if something has changed, like if we should kind of like, you know, just give a knock on the door, um, obviously during COVID that was, you know, somewhat frowned upon. It was folks we didn't know, but at the same time coming out of it, I think maybe we can see even more the value of that, of just being a little bit more cognizant of, uh, of the folks around us. Um, Cause you know, with, with those social determinants, it's small, small stuff a lot of the time, you know, it's just yeah. maybe taking that little step to, uh, to be able to help folks out. Cause um, yeah, it's really hard to get things funded. Even in a, even in a place like Vermont, that's as progressive as it is, you know, there's still struggles. Yeah. Um, especially for folks, I think of, um, you know, who are neurodivergent or who have, you know, a, a range of severe special needs. I mean, that's, that's an ongoing national problem even here. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, here we are a group of us gathered um, uh, on this uh, in the zoom forum, which, so it is true. If you don't have internet, <laughs> it would be hard to access this. Um, and I, I do believe that the federal government is going to invest a lot into improving um, internet access in rural envi environments. I, I, I'm certain of that. Um, but even this kind of a forum, that's why I was asking uh, Barbara and Davis, like, did this start during COVID or was it going beforehand? You know, this is easy. And yet, I, I, it's really fun to have an opportunity to hear about things and, and talk and, and what can we do? How can we think together about um, ideas? And this, we, we would have broken if someone lived alone and had no, no uh, contact with other folks, they could jump on a forum sponsored by the, the library. I and mean, I think this is a really exciting, I really think this is an exciting advance that has come out of COVID-19. I love getting together in person. And yes, we, we definitely, I, I yearn for the day when we're all back um, in person together, but I hope we don't forget this. And we have snowstorms and we have people who don't wanna drive at night. Um, and um, I hope we remember to use this kind of a forum to keep us together. And Amanda's got her hand up. Yes, Amanda. Thank you so much. What you're saying is so important. And I just wanted to remind people about Volunteers in Action and how it's a community program that helps Windsor, West Windsor, Weathersfield, Heartland, Plainfield, Redding, and Cornish. And it connects neighbors with need, with neighbors and people who care. And this is an expanding program. And for those that would like to call, the number is 802-674-5971. Or they can call Mount Escutney Hospital and Health Center and just ask for volunteers in action and be connected. So if you have a need, please reach out. We do live in a wonderful small community. And I know that this program is planning on growing and doing forums just like this to highlight our volunteers, the people who receive these benefits and services, but also to hear from the community. So let's stay connected, like you said, and just wanted to say that there is another resource here and that's volunteers in action. Thank you. Amanda, can I, um, I know we're getting close to time, but um, is, that a, uh, is that a group that has sponsorship from Mount Escutney Hospital? Yes, that's through the hospital. It coordinates all the volunteer activity at Mount Escutney Hospital and Health Center, the Community Meals on Wheels program in seven surrounding communities and hosts community meals um, each month in Heartland, Windsor, and Escutney. That sounds like Jill Lord, if I had to guess. Um, who's my hero? One of my heroes. So Amanda, 
that's exactly the kind of partnership that I'm hoping um, uh, that we can continue to foster in the years ahead. We had a similar um, uh, health system community coalition come together up uh, here at Dartmouth called Upper Valley Strong and one also in Sullivan called Greater Sullivan Strong. And we brought the health system together with 40, over 40 community organizations to work together to meet the needs of the patient, of, not sorry, I said patients, but the people, to invest dollars that were raised through Dartmouth Philanthropy. We dedicated some staff from the hospital to just like, how do you keep a meeting going and get coordinated? And it was like one of the richest experiences I've ever had, similar to your um, volunteers in action. It's, it's don't look to the hospital to solve all the problems. We don't, we're not trained to do this. We're trained to do, take out tumors and fix diabetes and put people on ventilators. But we do have a lot of resources that in partnership, in partnership with the community, I think can make a difference. Courtney, what are some small changes that hopefully lead to big changes? Oops, I lost it. Uh, that can contribute to shifting the distrust of the healthcare system. Can I ask you that, Courtney? I, and I'm really not being glib. What, what do you think will make a difference? Yeah, um, so I also work for Manuscutney Hospital in the community health department. and. For me, accessibility is always a key issue. And how do you shift that expecting uh, folks to come to where you're at to going to where they're at, but also building that relationship so that there's the foundational trust established and it. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know. Uh, it's it's a huge. I mean, if it's been you know something that's deeply rooted, it's a hard shift. Um, and right, you know and. I don't know how you know to kind of make those changes um, if they're you know that there's this trust for a reason. Um, yeah. So, you know how to kind of get that moving along. So I'm just thinking like vaccine accessibility, um, and, and you know that for example, and, and what that could look like as far as you know getting that trust there to get more people vaccinated, especially the BIPOC community. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's. I, I think I, I think your top your question's really big and really important. And there's probably ways to take bites of it, like vaccine um, vaccine concerns. So I like I can tell you one of the things we're doing is. In fact, I should I should send this to you, Davis or Barbara. Um, we're we're offering free courses on how community leaders can number one, understand the vaccine, and number two, have some strategies for how to talk to people when they express their concerns. Why are people concerned about vaccines? And you know, we're all talking about COVID-19 vaccine, but there's a, there's a large group of people who feel this way about all vaccines, right? So what are some of the um, strategies that you can use when you come in contact with um, folks who express concerns about uh, vaccines? And it, this is a, a free course that we are offering. We're halfway through. There were four. There are four sessions. There are four Fridays in June, um, bringing in some of like really outstanding local experts in uh, motivational interviewing and the science of vaccines. Um, so we're trying to do things like that um, to help. Also doing that for our healthcare providers, I will say. But I think that. Um, there are other deeper issues too, and um, lots of other issues for distrust. And I don't have, there's no silver bullet. I think this is gonna be something that we need to learn as a healthcare system to listen. What is it, where is the root of that distrust? And then what can we do together to break down those barriers? And like you said, Courtney, there are years and years and years of distrust and, um, and we, you know, I think one of the things that we all have to promise is to be transparent and to show the data and to 
have discussion, hard, hard conversations um, in the right forum. I I thought when I thought court, part of Courtney's question was going to be um, um, also related to um, is the distrust connected to the fact that when some people show up at the doctor's office or at the at the clinic, um, although there is an electronic uh, um, history of that particular individual, because right now Dartmouth is in the Scutney is they're all over. Yeah, yeah. And so they haven't. I, anyone who's living in the area um, has probably visited one of the hospitals, which means that they should, wherever they visit, they should have access to their history. So I, I thought she was thinking, um, is it possible that doctors can? If they are going to see someone, they can check into their history before they sit down and talk with them and, and ask them, you know, what's what's your yeah. problem? Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't know if that was part of what she was asking, but but that's something that I've wondered about. I, I know whenever um, I've seen a doctor, a lot of information is taken. Um, and um, but is that information ever looked at, as you mentioned with Sally yeah. earlier? I mean, clearly there was a history, but they didn't have access to that information. Yeah, I, um, it, I, I agree with you. It doesn't instill much trust when someone walks in and you know they have access to a lot of information and then they're asking you the same questions. Um, I, ha I guess my response to that is uh, twofold. Um, one is, um, Sometimes when you're, when you're coming in, like I'm a pulmonologist, I do lung medicine, and I may be asking questions that are similar to what you've been asked before, but I'm asking them with a, for a different reason, as a specialist asking the question. So I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying that sometimes I will want to repeat some of those questions. Um, the, other, the other thing that's... Um, um, Two other things. One other, one other part is sometimes these medical records are so long and there's so much in it. It's really hard to comb out what the important part is quickly, right? We don't, if I had an hour to look at everyone's chart, it would be great, but I don't have an hour. I've got, you know, a focused period of time, a couple of minutes I need to get through. And, and it sometimes it is really hard to find what you're looking for in these long, long, long records. The other thing that I'll say, um, and this is part of uh, my anal compulsiveness, but I think some docs are like this, allergies. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you the first time I see you what your allergies are. I don't care how many people have asked you, but I want to know from you what you tell me your allergies are. Because for me, that is such critical information. And quite honestly, I've been stung so many times by, oh, I'll look at the allergy list. I'm just using allergies as an example. I'll look at the allergy list. It says penicillin. I walk in the room. Hello, nice to meet you. Um, what can I do for you today? Let's look at your allergies. What are your allergies? Penicillin and sulfa. Sulfa? I don't have sulfa the list. And so sometimes you do discover, especially really, really critical medical information that needs to be there. Not an excuse, but I'll tell you something. Sorry, but that's just like how I am. <laughs> and, um, and I know there are other docs who are the same way. But I, I the bigger, the bigger lesson is, you got all this medical information, you walk in it and you act like you didn't even look at it. So how am I supposed to trust that the system is working right to take care of me? I think that's a legitimate concern. I don't have the answer for it. 
Well, I just want to, I want to put my um, email and Davis, please feel free to, um, to send that around um, in, my email in the text. And I am very, very sincere when I say, if you have a thought about, you know, this would be kind of an interesting idea. Let me throw it out there. Um, I'm eager to hear. We don't have the answers. We're, we're going to have to find new solutions to really old problems. I'm grateful that we have this opportunity, not only us coming here to talk, but this opportunity in, in our history to say, what did we learn from this past year, which has just, in, for, just ended up with so much pain and so much death and so much concern. But what it's, it also has done is really made it absolutely unambiguous that we have disparities in our healthcare system that we have. And, and when I say healthcare, remember 80-20, I'm not just talking about going to the hospital. I'm talking about income and employment and opportunities. We have to figure out how to do a better job. And the healthcare system needs to be a partner, but we are not we won't have all the answers. So throw me some ideas. I, I won't promise you that I will, uh, I, I can promise you I won't implement all the ideas. <laughs> I only have this many uh, hours in the day, but um, that's the only way we're gonna learn is to continue the dialogue. This was really great, Th Sally. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity and everyone be safe out there. If you haven't gotten your vaccine, if you want, if you have questions about the vaccine, you can give me a call, but um, vaccines are safe, they're effective and get your vaccine if you haven't gotten it. Yes, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight, Sally, and uh, giving that really, really amazing eye-opening presentation. I'm, I'm glad so many folks are able to come out and see it. Um, again, this is going to be available on Windsor on Air, um, so hopefully it'll reach many, many more people um, in broadcast and on Vimeo. And